This creature, Chicago Burlington and Quincy number 9912, the Silver Pilot, is a living dinosaur. It's a survivor from the first generation of diesels, preserved at the Illinois Railway Museum at Union, just 50 miles northwest of Chicago. She's a stainless steel reminder of the diesel-electric power that replaced steam on North American railroads during the 1940s, 50s, and into the 60s. Mostly this first generation has in turn yielded to newer generations of diesels. But there are exceptions to this, as we'll show you in First Generation Diesels, A Search for the Survivors. Presented by Trains Magazine. Here at the museum, you can see 18 diesels from all the major builders. Many of the first generation units are in operating condition. We'll use these diesels as an introduction to the locomotives that changed railroading. This program is made possible locally by Hobby Center Toys. We'll look at early units from five builders. Featuring the Electromotive Tyco, Division of General Hoffman, Motors, Lifelike, and others. The plus other professional model railroad brands and a full line of accessories. The Lionel Hamilton Corporation. and Fairbanks Morrison Company. Of these, only EMD is still building locomotives. In spirit, we'll be staying ahead of the ivory hunters. That's a phrase coined by trains editor David P. Morgan for a photo caption of a Norfolk and Western Y6 steam locomotive in the June 1959 issue. This mentality or pursuit, the desire to record the last survivors before they are scrapped, carries us from steam into diesels. Remarkably though, even today in the mid-1980s, not all first-generation diesels are in museums or scrapyards. We'll search out alcoves around the country where these diesels still toil every day. 30-year-old machines still hauling freight and passengers. We'll also show you what these diesels were like in their prime. For that, we'll draw upon some rare 8 and 16 millimeter film, some of it 40 years old. Dave Ingalls, the managing editor of Trains Magazine, will lead our search for these survivors. This Burlington E5, which bears initial CNS for Burlington subsidiary Colorado and Southern, is one of the E-Series design that helped make Electromotive Division of General Motors the most successful diesel builder in America. The models range from predecessors TA and EA on through each number, E1, E2, all the way through E9. Over 1,300 E units in all series were built by EMD. This E5 unit shares its long slanted nose design with sisters E3, E4, and E6. Burlington had the only E5s and Seaboard Airline the only E4s. Interestingly, the E5s were built before the E4s in 1940. What made the E5 unique was the fluted stainless steel side panels. They matched the bud-built Zephyr trains the Burlington had. The rectangular portholes were common to early E units. Besides this unit, other early E units preserved include a former Atlantic Coastline E3 owned by an individual in Wisconsin and a Louisville and Nashville E6 at the Kentucky Railway Museum in Louisville. This Rock Island E6, number 630, is preserved at the Kansas City Railway Museum. 
14 railroads bought 113 E6s, the last slant nose EMD passenger unit. Among them were IC, Chicago and Northwestern, and Southern. With the E7, the EMD passenger diesel became standardized. Its bulldog nose carried through to the final E units, the E8 and E9. The E7 was the most popular model with a total of 479 units. A few lasted into the early 1970s on Amtrak. A Pennsylvania E7 survives at the State Museum at Strasburg. 2,000 horsepower was standard on the E3s through E7s. On the E8s, it jumped to 2250, and on the E9s to 2400. On the outside, though, an E8 was virtually indistinguishable from an E9. The E-8s and E-9s ran throughout the country, but reigned supreme on the Union Pacific City Streamliners. And the Illinois Central's Chocolate and Orange Fleet out of Chicago. From Chicago to the Twin Cities, Denver, and Kansas City, the Burlington Silver E units pulled a variety of jobs. Operating out of one pool, they handled the Zephyrs, locals, and commuter trains to Aurora. Remarkably, some of them are still pulling the commuter runs to Aurora. All these units are now considered E9s because of rebuilding in the early 70s. The Burlington Northern now operates the largest remaining fleet of 25 units. These green and white dinosaurs handle 68 commuter trains each weekday between Chicago and Aurora. The Burlington operates these commuter trains for Chicago's Regional Transportation Authority. Engineer Harold Landorf says the Burlington E's still give good service. Need nine? Oh, I'd say it's pretty nice. It's uh, probably the best engine they ever made for passenger service, I would say. With the two engines that are in there, that if you have engine trouble of some kind, why, at least you have the other engine to uh, keep going with it, you know? What's going to happen to the E's? You know, they'll probably just phase them right out, I suppose. When uh, I think we're the last suburban service around here with the, the E's right now. Uh, maybe uh, Northwestern might have a couple. I don't think they have any plans to rebuild anymore. Probably going to what Amtrak's got, I suppose. I don't know. 
But when these are gone, some will still remain. The Alaska Railroad has two E9s from Amtrak. UP maintains one for company specials, and New Jersey Transit has a handful on standby for its commuter runs. Museums are now home for many retired E8s and E9s, such as this Milwaukee Road E9 at the Illinois Railway Museum. In Roanoke, Virginia, Transportation Museum is Electromotive Division's 10,000th unit, Wabash E8, number 1009. At St. Louis Museum of Transport is Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac E8. In Omaha is a Union Pacific E9. In the Sacramento State Railway Museum in California is a Southern Pacific Daylight E9. And there are Southern E8s in Georgia and North Carolina. Now, several ex-Amtrak E units are receiving older color schemes by their individual owners, including those of New York Central Lightning Stripes and Southern Pacific Daylight Colors. Electromotive's other covered wagon series, the F, followed the early E's in 1939 with the demonstration of famed FT set number 103. After this, the stage was set for dieselization. The F series went through FT, F2, F3, and F7, culminating in F9. Over 2,000 F7s, like this Milwaukee Road example, were built. This classic styling first appeared on the FT demonstrator number 103. The so-called bulldog nose of EMD is the most universally known diesel outline. The curves and lines are difficult for an artist to draw, difficult to model from scratch. It's truly a fetching profile. F units became the standard for recognition by the public when the word diesel was mentioned, and Santa Fe's war bonnet red and silver passenger F3s and F7s were the focus of that fame. Of the over 1,000 FTs built, Santa Fe had almost one-third, with 320. 23 railroads bought FTs. FTs were intended for freight, but Santa Fe re-geared and repainted some for passenger work. Other roads, including Rio Grande and Great Northern, used FTs on varnish also. One Southern FT is at the St. Louis Museum of Transport. F3s, on the other hand, were built for both freight and passenger service. Almost 1,500 F3s were built between 1946 and 49 as the railroads began to dieselize in earnest. Here are some examples from Chicago and Northwestern, CB&Q, GM&O, and the Monon. Remarkably, one small fleet of F3s survived mostly intact in the mid-1980s on a major railroad, the 494-mile Bangor and Aroostook in Maine. The BAR is a former potato hauler that now makes its living hauling pulp wood and wood products. Diesel shop foreman Stan Garland says the F3 fleet continues to shrink. The 42 is the only F3 we have in service as, as of right now. Our, uh, the other F3s are serviceable, but it's, we've purchased some new power. They're not so efficient for yard service because they're uh, due to the fact they have to more or less hold the, look out the windows for directions from the rear, especially. And it's, in the wintertime, it causes quite a lot of, of discomfort. This uh, particular locomotive has over 2 million miles on it. F3 number 42 appears pretty much as built in 1947. It toils daily with the BAR's other first-generation EMD regulars, 16 GP7s and 5 GP9s. Continual improvements by EMD resulted in the new model designation of F7, still with 1,500 horsepower. Later F3s and early F7s are difficult to tell apart. New York Central had over 350 Fs. Southern had over 400 Fs. The F7 was the all-time champ of covered wagons with almost 4,000 built, including booster units, from 1949 through 1953. They could be found in all 48 states plus Alaska. Like the F3, they were built for both freight and passenger service. 
Seaboard system still maintains four former Clinchfield Fs for special passenger trains, two A's and two B's. Sioux Line kept four Fs for snowplow trains into the 1980s because of their visibility and warm cabs. Amtrak inherited F7s from Santa Fe and Burlington Northern for its use in the early 70s. An interesting fact about Santa Fe's passenger F units is that only the booster units were equipped with steam generators. This Milwaukee Road F7 is one of more than a dozen Fs already preserved in museums, but F7s are still running in daily service. New Jersey Transit runs four F7s on lease from Chicago and Northwestern but they're repainted for NJT. They handle commuter trains on the former Erie Lackawanna routes out of Hoboken. Like Seaboard System, Northwestern retains four so-called presidential F7s for special passenger trains, both for its officials and the public. A few other F7s remain on the rosters of Bessemer and Lake Erie, Kansas City Southern, and the 52-mile Louisiana and Northwest. It runs a handful in daily service in Arkansas and Louisiana. The FB7 was identical to the F7, except it was four feet longer to accommodate a steam generator. Over 200 were built. One of Seaboard System's special Fs was Clinchfield's only FB7, and Norfolk Southern keeps four so-called heritage FB7s in their traditional Southern Railway green and white for use on excursions and official trips. A first cousin to the FB7 was the FL9, a 1,750 horsepower unit with a B and an A1A truck. It was built for the New Haven as a dual diesel and third rail electric unit for use on passenger trains out of Grand Central Terminal. 60 were built from 1956 to 1960, and a dozen or so survive in New York commuter service for Metro North on former New Haven and New York Central routes. The F9 was a 1,750 horsepower covered wagon that coincided with the change from Jeep 7 to Jeep 9. Only 268 were built for U.S. railroads. Perhaps the most famous F9, and without a doubt the most photographed, was Rio Grande number 5771, which was the road's last cab unit. Along with two F9Bs, it led the Rio Grande Zephyr between Denver and Salt Lake City for over a decade after Amtrak's creation. But it went in storage in 1984. This Maryland Department of Transportation unit, called an F9PH, is one of five former Baltimore and Ohio F7s, which run on B&O lines out of Washington. They were rebuilt by Morrison Knudsen in Boise, Idaho. F units rebuilt especially for commuter service work on a daily basis out of Washington and Boston. MBTA, the Boston Commuter Authority, runs a dozen modern-looking so-called FP10s, which are former Gulfmobile and Ohio F3s, rebuilt by Illinois Central Gulf at Paducah, Kentucky. In 1948 and 49, EMD produced the Branch Line Unit, or BL. The demonstrator was the BL-1. 58 production BL-2s were bought by nine railroads. Bangor and Aroostook operated the last BL-2s in revenue service and still has seven stored on the property. Three others survive. Both of Western Maryland's are preserved, one at the B&O Museum in Baltimore, and the other at the Cass Scenic Railway in West Virginia. Monon 32 is at the Kentucky Railway Museum in Louisville. This Jeep, or general purpose locomotive, was known as every man's locomotive. It was found on virtually every major road except Alco strongholds, such as Gulfmobile in Ohio, Delaware and Hudson, and Long Island. They came in models GP7, 9, and 18, virtually identical in appearance. This Illinois terminal unit is a GP7. It still carries both its Illinois terminal number 1605 and its later number 3406 after acquisition by the Norfolk and Western in 1982. Over 1,200 Jeep 7s like the Illinois terminal Jeep were built. They were ideal for yard switching, for way freights, or for use in multiple on-road freights.
Remarkably for the time, a California group had two Santa Fe Jeep 7s on a fan trip as early as 1954. Many railroads have rebuilt their early Jeeps. In most cases, this has changed their exterior appearance. Either a low short hood or nose or other car body details. Here and there, though, Jeep 7s survive in daily service as built. An example is number 1830 of the Chattahoochee Industrial, a 15-mile railroad built in 1963 in southwest Georgia. The road relies mostly on Alco RS1s, but also owns former Central of Georgia Jeep 7, number 121. Engineer Dave Godwin likes his Jeep more than the Alcos. Well, when we first got this, then, a lot of the boys didn't want to run it because it operated different, you know. Is that right? We run, run them alcoves out there, and uh, it worked different. It worked a lot different than those alcoves. I mean, the brake system worked different, and uh, it didn't seem the brake system wouldn't hold quite as good as them alcoves, but uh, you had to had to real work fast. I mean, you got to you use your engine brake, and then you had to use a little bit of automatic brake. And to me, I really enjoyed running it. In 1952, EMD brought out a sister to the GP7, the SD7 with six-wheel trucks. The successor to the Jeep 7 in 1954 was the Jeep 9, the first generation sales champ for a single model. Over 3,200 were sold in the U.S. Like several roads which dieselized late, Grand Trunk Western relied on Jeeps for all its passenger diesel power. Norfolk and Western was late to dieselize and relied on Jeep 9s exclusively for its passenger service. First painted red to match the Pocahontas region trains, after merger with Nickel Plate and Wabash in 1964, they were painted blue. Illinois Central dieselized its freight service with black Jeep 9s, but also had four with passenger gearing. Along with the Jeep 9 came the six-motor SD9. They're still in road service on Chicago and Illinois Midland, Burlington Northern, Southern Pacific, and Mesabi Road, and in yard service on Chessie, EJ&E, and Norfolk Southern. Along with the Jeep 7, the ivory hunters of today can find Jeep 9s at work, looking as built in the 1950s. You'll find them in yard service and on road trains. The unmistakable chant of the EMD engine coming from under a Jeep's hood can still be heard. First-generation EMD switchers like this DTNI 1,000 horsepower NW2 still work on Class 1 roads and short lines. More common are the 1,200 horsepower SW7s, SW9s, and SW1200s. Although the early Jeeps showed the road switcher concept to be practical, it was Alco that first put the road switcher concept on the rails. That was in 1941 with the RS1. This Grand Trunk RS1 was the last one built in 1957. Over 600 RS1s were sold to over a dozen roads. They were used for everything from switching coach yards to hauling freight, sometimes in sets of two or four units. In many cases, the short hood housed a steam generator. 
The Tennessee Railroad RS1s came from the Rutland and Atlanta and St. Andrews Bay Railroads. RS1s continue to work today in several places. They switch for Amtrak in Washington, D.C., and they're in daily service on short lines such as the Green Mountain in Vermont and the Chattahoochee Industrial in Georgia. The Green Mountain operates 53 miles of old Rutland track between Bellows Falls and Rutland, Vermont for freight service. It runs the Vermont Historical Passenger Excursions on the first 13 miles from Bellow Falls to Chester. That's where this footage was shot. The road has this former Rutland RS1 and two others from the Illinois Terminal. The Rutland unit has been modified some over the years, according to Kevin Smith. Oh, the 405, of course, is, uh, is nothing like it would have looked in the Rutland days. We've uh, uh, put the crossing bell up, uh, up, uh, up high on the hood to keep the snow and the dirt out of it for better sound, and it's got sealed beam headlights now, and uh, it has the, uh, the new uh, federal, uh, federally mandated switcher steps. Uh, Boy, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a far, uh, it's a far cry from the way it was in the Rutland. Uh, if we were going to restore it as an antique locomotive, that'd be one thing. But of course, this is a, a work in a railroad, and we can't be uh, bothered with, uh, uh, with things that may be detrimental to our operation. Oh, the Alcos, of course, yeah, the Alcos uh, have better visibility than, uh, than the newer, bigger engines because the hoods are lower. It's, uh, the RS1 is basically a switch engine that uh, had uh, a short hood added on the back end for a steam heat generator and also uh, uh, swing bolster trucks for a uh, higher speed ride. Uh, it, it rides well. I wouldn't say that it rides comparably better or worse than any other road locomotive. The six RS1s on the Chattahoochee Industrial have also been modified some. They're real individuals since their numbers are part of railroad history. Number three, originally from the Atlanta and St. Andrews Bay, commemorates the general of Civil War fame. Number 97 from the Washington Terminal recalls the song about the wreck of Southern's old 97. You remember the part about being scalded to death by the steam. And number 382 is a memorial to Casey Jones and his IC engine. It's from the Chicago and Eastern Illinois. The RS-1 was based on Alco switchers like this 660 horsepower S-1 at the Illinois Railway Museum. The S-1 first appeared in 1940. The RS-1 and S-1 were essentially the same design, but the switcher had a shorter frame and the cab at one end. Early Alco switchers had a tall hood and so were called high hoods. Similar to the S-1 were the S-2s, 3s, and 4s. The 2s and 4s had 1,000 horsepower. Over 2,500 were built between 1940 and 1958. The stacks and shape of the radiator distinguished them from the 660 horsepower S1s and 3s. Alco switchers still work on many short lines and industrial roads. After World War II, Alco increased the horsepower on its road switchers, turning out 1,500 horsepower RSC2s and RS2s for Milwaukee Road and Detroit and Mackinac. The RSC3 and RS3 like this one, originally from Minnesota Transfer, followed with 1,600 horsepower. There were very few RSC types of either model, but the RS2 and RS3 showed up on almost every road east of the Mississippi River. By the mid-1980s, RS3s were virtually gone from major roads, confined to short lines and museums. This RS3 is the standby unit on the Lake Superior in Ishpeming. 
This Delaware Otsego excursion offers an unusual opportunity to compare Alco's pre-war and post-war road switchers. Here at Honesdale, Pennsylvania are a Susquehanna RS3 and RS1. The RS3 became Alco's counterpart to EMD's Jeep and was a familiar sight on roads such as Louisville and Nashville. This pair works the hump at De Courcy Yard in Covington, Kentucky. Erie assigned RS3s to its New Jersey commuter trains. After the 1964 Norfolk and Western merger, this nickel plate RS3 worked a transfer through Delray Junction in Detroit on the old Wabash. Some railroads loyal to Alco hung onto their RS3s and rebuilt them. In 1975, Green Bay and Weston replaced the 244 model engines in four of its RS3s with 251C engines. To accommodate the 251, the long hood had to be raised slightly. The short hood was lowered to increase visibility. In 1985, GBW number 308 was one of the survivors working the East End job and the Northwestern Interchange in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Although this 255-mile line across Wisconsin owns 19 Alcos, its RS3s generally are confined to yard and local work at Green Bay and Wisconsin Rapids. Newer century-type Alcos work the road trains to Winona, Minnesota. Although rebuilt, this RS3 still shows the hallmark spotting features of the model. A prominent stack, the rounded radiator fan housing atop the long hood, the rounded hood itself, and the square radiator shutters at the end of the long hood. After World War II, Alco had to play catch up to EMD's freight cab diesels. In 1945, the Gulf Mobile in Ohio got the first 1,500 horsepower cab units. These became known as FA1s. Later units with 1,600 horses were called FA-2s. All boosters were called FBs. Over two dozen roads had FAs and Bs. These Union Pacific FA-1s crossed the Mojave Desert in 1951. Sioux Line's FAs pass on a freight in Wisconsin. Here's a comparison between the FA and EMD cabs on the CNO's Ohio River Bridge at Cincinnati in 1966. An LNN FA2 leads the F7s into Kentucky. New York Central had the largest FA fleet, almost 200 units. This is the Central's main line at Toledo, Ohio. These FAs are returning to Sharonville Yard, north of Cincinnati, in 1966. This re-engine Rock Island FA-1 leads a westbound freight in 1965. Well, the only remaining FAs work for the Long Island Railroad as power cars. They provide the heat and lighting on these commuter trains. Another diesel on the opposite end actually moved the train. Long Island FAs came from the Burlington Northern, the Penn Central, the LNN, and the Western Maryland. Alco's answer to EMD's E unit was a slant nose series that became known as DL109s. This Milwaukee Road version departs Milwaukee in the 1940s. The New Haven had 60 of these 78 units. None are preserved. The successor to the DL-109 was the PA. Santa Fe got the first one in 1946 when it was simply called a 2,000 horsepower passenger unit. Santa Fe had more PAs than any other railroad. Because the PAs tended to release a lot of smoke, 
A rider for trains labeled them honorary steam engines. No PAs are preserved in the U.S. Although built for passenger service, several roads put them into freight service. One was the Erie Lackawanna. This trio leaves Marion, Ohio on a hot July day in 1966. The RSD-15 can be considered an honorary first-generation diesel just because it's been in service since 1959. The Lake Superior in Ishpeming has six former Santa Fe units that haul ore trains on Michigan's Upper Peninsula. The RSD-15 has an obvious nickname, the Alligator. That's because of its long, low, short hood and its lanky feet or trucks. LS and I originally painted the units solid brown, but some of them have been repainted a bright red-brown with stripes. The alligator has distinctive Alco details. The notch nose with the sand filler caps on both ends and the square radiator grills on the long hood. Two other alligators, also from the Santa Fe, are used by Peabody Coal in southern Indiana. Third in diesel production behind EMD and Alco was the Baldwin Locomotive Works whose units were known for their lugging gutsiness. This center cab transfer unit at the Illinois Railway Museum is one of Baldwin's biggest units. Besides the Minneapolis Northfield and Southern, six other roads owned center cabs. In fact, Baldwin designed the unit for the Elgin, Joliet, and Eastern, a belt line around Chicago owned by U.S. Steel. EJ&E's center cabs continued in service into the 1970s after most of the others were scrapped. The secret? EJ&E replaced the Baldwin engines with EMDs. This changed the appearance of the units because EMD switcher hoods covered the new engines. These two re-engined cabs are pulling through the Grand Trunk, Erie, and CNO crossings at Griffith, Indiana. This center cab has a new engine too, but it's getting a little more help from EMD in the form of an SW-1200. In 1945, Baldwin actually beat Alco to market with a 1500 horsepower road switcher. The first DRS-64-1500 unit went to the Columbus and Greenville, a Mississippi short line. Remarkably, the original unit, CNG number 601, lasted until 1984 and is preserved in Columbus, Mississippi. A later sister was still used occasionally in 1985. By adding another 100 horsepower, Baldwin created the AS616s. The CNO favored these for transfer and pusher service in Cincinnati. Also in Cincinnati, the Baltimore and Ohio used AS16s for transfer runs. A junior version of the Baldwin road switcher was the DRS441000. The later 1,200 horsepower model, the RS-12, was originally used by the New York Central on commuter trains. Finally, the RS-12s were reduced to transfer and yard service in Cincinnati. Seaboard Airline had 10 RS-12s, and several of them survive on the Escanaba in Lake Superior in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. The ENLS was one of the last roads in 1985 with Baldwin's. Baldwin men helped ENLS rebuild one former seaboard unit. ENLS repainted it orange and green, similar to the old Great Northern scheme. It's switching some second-hand Canadian passenger cars that are used on shipper special. The yellow RS-12 being switched into the shed is a former seaboard unit that later belonged to Oregon, California, and Eastern.
In storage on the ENLS are the last two Baldwin cab units in existence. Shark knows his number 1205 and 1216. Built for the New York Central in 1951 and 52, these Sharks were working in Cincinnati in 1966. Central used them in Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan. Later, some worked for the Monongahela in Pennsylvania. Then these last two were preserved by the Delaware and Hudson. Now owned by an individual, they are still in their D&H colors. Most roads that operate at Baldwin's seem to like the switchers best. This is a former Youngstown sheet and tube 660 horsepower model. Besides the Escanaba and Lake Superior, Baldwin switchers still operate on short lines in South Carolina, Texas, and California. Most of these are the later S12 models. The Pennsylvania was synonymous with Baldwin, and some former Pensy switchers like this DS441000 lasted into the Penn Central era. In 1950, Baldwin acquired Lima to form the Baldwin Lima Hamilton Corporation, and Lima's small line of switchers and road switchers was dropped. This Lima is from the greatest collection of malls, Armco Steel of Middletown, Ohio, which had 27 units. Five of them bought new and 22 used. This one, number E110, is the last Lima to be purchased new. 160 Lima Hamilton switchers were built for 11 railroads. The horsepower ranged from 750 to 1200. The switchers looked and smoked like Alcos and were often mistaken for them. Wabash compounded the confusion by repowering its 12 switchers with Alco FA engines. Cincinnati, not far from the Lima, Ohio shops, was a haven for Limas. B&O had switchers there, Armco was nearby, and Cincinnati Union Terminal used six 750 horsepower Lima switchers. New York Central's 16 1200 horsepower Lima road switchers worked their final years at Cincinnati in the late 60s. They looked a lot like Alco RS1s. They originally pulled commuter trains on the old West Shore. When you consider the small number of Limas that were built, it's amazing that any survived. This is the Whitewater Valley, a tourist line not far from Cincinnati, where this unit first worked. The line operates between Connersville and Metamora in southeast Indiana on a former New York Central branch line. Engineer Dorrance Taylor takes great pride in his 750 horsepower Lima. The engine was purchased new by Cincinnati Union Terminal, Cincinnati, and uh, they sold it when they went out of business to uh, Cadillac and uh, Lake Charles, in Michigan, and we got it uh, from them. That was our, I said, that was our first locomotive. Uh, one of the fellows that used to run it up at Cadillac was down here at the park one day, and he came up and he was surprised to see the thing still running. Number 25 still hauls passenger cars, but now they're filled with school kids and fans. We'll run it as long as we can, and I'd, uh, I don't know, I suppose we'll just set it aside for a museum piece, because uh, it, and I understand that it and, only, and one other one is the only one of that type of Lima Hamilton that's still in operation. Yes, that's true, the Illinois Railway Museum's Lima still runs. In June of 1985, it worked as the museum switcher.
The last major diesel builder was Fairbanks Morrison Company, whose locomotives from 1944 to 1963 used the unusual opposed piston engine. This 2,000 horsepower road switcher from Southwest Portland Cement Company in Victorville, California, will be restored by the Illinois Railway Museum to its original Union Pacific livery. To accommodate the opposed piston engine, the hood was flushed with the cab, making it look somewhat like a high hood Alco. Of the 96 H2044s that were built, the Pennsylvania owned 26 of them. This pair worked a transfer in Cincinnati in the late 60s. FM's answer to the Jeep and RS3 were 1,500 and 1,600 horsepower road switchers like this Milwaukee Road H1644. In March 1985, this unmarked H1044 might have been the last FM diesel in regular service in the U.S. It still has the colors of its former owner, the Minneapolis Northfield and Southern. It's working at Waukesha, Wisconsin, cleaning out the last cars of the central Wisconsin. The road went bankrupt at the end of 1984. After the shutdown, almost all of the FMs were cut up for scrap. Number 10 was spared for the last cleanup work. The Central Wisconsin operated on former Milwaukee Road branch lines and the former Illinois Central line to Madison, Wisconsin. Road had 14 Milwaukee Road FM switchers, plus number 10 from the MNNS. Former Milwaukee Road mechanics were hired to maintain the units. This section of the railroad from Waukesha West was part of the state's first railroad. The Milwaukee and Mississippi laid track in the 1850s. These two passenger cars, one South Shore and one Chicago CTA, are museum cars. To avoid being stranded by the closing of the Central Wisconsin, they had to move over the Sioux line to their new home in East Troy, Wisconsin. This is the first Fairbanks Morris unit ever built. It too is an H1044 and was bought by the Milwaukee Road in 1944. It served the railroad until 1981 when it was sold to the Illinois Railway Museum. Even though this unit is still operable because of dedicated museum volunteers, other museum units have lost their engines. The opposed piston engines are widely sought for marine and stationary applications. And while this type of ivory hunting is real, we have found operating railroads with first-generation diesel. EMDE units still handle commuter trains in Chicago. Alco road switchers still pour out their black smoke in at least three states. Baldwin switchers can still be seen operating in Upper Michigan. A Lima Hamilton still travels up and down a valley in Indiana.
and Fairbanks Morris switchers until recently worked the central Wisconsin. Even as we planned this first generation diesel program, we saw their ranks thin even more on the railroads. Soon, the only place you may be able to find them operating is in museums. There are non-operating Fairbanks Morse car bodies preserved in museums in Kansas City and Bellevue, Ohio. 760 here is significant because she still operates and probably will be operating long after her sisters have quit on workaday railroads. But in the meantime, you still can stay ahead of the ivory hunters. Toys, the area's model railroad headquarters, featuring Lionel, Tyco, Bachman, Lifelike, and others, plus other professional model railroad brands and a full line of accessories. Laurel's beautiful O-scale Great Southern.